next up we've got uh, a friend of mine presenting, Sam Greenwood. So I'm here to talk to you guys about types and static analysis, uh, more so in PHP than in JavaScript, uh, sort of like what Michael touched on this morning with his talk. Uh, so as Michael mentioned, I'm Sam Greenwood, uh, Sam T. Greenwood on Twitter, where I probably should be a bit more active, but I'm not. Uh, I'm the technology manager at Unity Group, we're a, a telco, so we deal with all sort of, all things telco, um, and I like types. So this is what I think your code base will look like <laughs> without types. And hopefully this <laughs> is what it will <laughs> with types. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, okay, so, so what are types? So um, types are what we give our, our, well variables are types. They're a thing that we assign to something in our code. And you know, there's, there's lots of different types. We've got integers, we've got strings, we've got classes that we give to types. Um, there's also lots of different types. And all languages, or well, most languages implement types in a different way. A number of different languages do, do different things with types. Um, so we've got dynamic types, and they are defined when we use them. So for example, PHP is a dynamic language, we have dynamic types. If we give a variable an integer, it becomes an integer. So we've got static types, so they're defined before we use them. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Um, <laughs> so before, you, before uh, giving a variable a type, we have to say this is an integer, and then we can only give it integers, and if we give it something else, the programming language or the compiler or the interpreter or something will yell at us, which can be good for catching bugs, uh, which some people can be annoying for doing crazy dynamic things, like you'll see probably deep in, in like inside of Laravel, inside of Symfony, they're doing, doing things that you may not be able to do with um, static types. So, you know, there is, is trade-offs there where, you know, to extract out interfaces and things like that, just for some functionality, it may not be worth it, and there is benefit in having a fully dynamic language. So we have strong types. So strong types can never change. So once it's defined, so you can have a static strong type, this is always an integer, then you can um, have a dynamic strong type in some languages, once you assign a variable, uh, a type with a variable, uh, that will also never be able to change. And weak types, they have a type right now, and it can change. And you know, being at a, a PHP conference in JavaScript, that's probably what most people here are used to. Uh, you define something, you use it again and again and again, and nothing's, uh, nothing's gonna happen, not, nothing's gonna get upset, but that's okay. So, PHP, it's a dynamic weak language, as we've talked about. Do we wish it was something else? Maybe, I mean, there's been a lot of talk in the community to leverage um, types, we see RFCs coming into language all the time to add more information around typing. PHP 7, obviously, we got um, scalar typings to allow us to define integers and strings, booleans, etc., as types in our variables, but also then return type hints. So we got to say that I want this function to always return this type, and then PHP at a language level would complain if you didn't do that, and, and that's good. So there are tools that can help with this. Uh, if we want sort of stronger type checking and so stronger inference. And PHP 7.4, we get some more goodies coming out of the box there around um, defining variables up front with their types, so more of that, that strong typing. So on classes, you'll be able to start defining variables as an integer or a string or an object. Um, that just makes for sort of clearer intent. Type show intent. What am I passing into this function? You know, for example, we have a date, a function that takes in a date, we have no type on there. Is it a string representation of a date? Is it in seconds? Is it a, a date object? No one, no one really knows. So this leads us into th things like duck typing. You know, <laughs> if it sounds like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. This is probably electricity, I'm not really sure. Um, so OO, in its truest sense, um, was always just about duck typing and message passing, and if a, a function responded to something you're giving it, that's okay. And that's sort of traditionally where OO began, and then we got to the, you know, the world of Java and consultants and enterprise, and they've kind of ruined it for everyone, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, OO in a truest sense is about 
duck typing and being dynamic and just objects responding to messages that they get. Um, but you know, in some cases as well, this can be, be a curse by just not having clear intent. You're, you know, you're passing in something, you don't know what it's going to do, you just hope that your edge case is handled and otherwise your application won't catch on fire. <laughs> so in my opinion, types make your code easier to read because of this. So you can look at a class, you can say that, oh, this is a date time instance, for example, we can give it a date time. Um, you can also do a lot of stuff around generating documentation, generating public API. This becomes you know, very, um, very helpful for public packages as well. Um, cut down on you know, GitHub issues that people are raising saying, oh, I put this in here and it didn't work. It's like, okay, we're not handling this edge case. That kind of goes away if you're giving your, API, your public API some types for people to use. Um, also documentation generation, we do a lot of this. Um, for internal stuff, you know, generates um, API documentation for internal modules and things like that to say, you know, this is the public API of, of this part of the system. Um, becomes pretty invaluable when you've got a sort of medium or large team or a distributed team. So types, I think, are good to avoid the fear cycle. And all of these tools that I'll be talking about next are going to kind of build on this and how we can leverage these things to, to not get into this cycle. So just raise of hands, who's ever had this happen to them? A small change in a code base, it's gonna have horrible unintended results. You think this one line thing, I'll fix the bug. No, that's great. So I guess you could also argue, if you had test coverage, this would be covered. You know, Legacy applications, you might not be able to have that luxury, but by sometimes introducing better type checking and using some of these other tools I'll talk about a bit soon, um, you'll be able to kind of infer these things before you ship code, before it happens. Um, especially if you don't have luxury of you know, good test suites and things like that. So then we start to fear making changes. We just go, we're going to put this code in the corner and we're not going to touch it. We don't want to deal with it. I mean, everyone's got that in some system somewhere, right? Um, we try to make every change as small and as local as possible. So you know, if we do have to change something, we're going to go in and do the bare minimum, we're going to copy something else and rename it so we're not changing existing behaviour. Um, we're going to you know, keep adding more and more craft, more duplication just to try and get away from you know, making that small change that we thought we could do at the start of this process. But we end up with more mess. The code, code base accumulates warts, knobs, special cases, ifs, everything else. Okay, so this leads into static analysis. So what is static analysis? So computers can read code better than humans can. I mean, that's, that's their job after all, right? We give them code, they, they give us applications that work. So static analysis sort of lets, lets us infer information about our software, about our code, about our structure before running it through the compiler or the interpreter or whatever else. It's just looking at the text and seeing what it can work out about the code. And this allows the, the system to infer as much about um, the code as possible. So static analysis in PHP. So uh, hands up for PHP Storm users in, in the room. That's a lot. So um, PHP Storm tries to do this for you um, as part of its indexing method. It will go look at types and go look at those sort of things. Um, that's one of the things it does when it's being really, really slow. Um, it's trying to look at your code to work out, you know, I've said I want this class over here or I'm calling this method on something else and it will try and infer that, oh yes, I'm pretty sure that I've got this method on this object, um, you know, or I've given this function an integer where it should have been a string. If you're trying to call like a, one of the string functions on a number, like it can complain about that depending on how you've got it set up. Um, also complain about nulls, you know, if you've got null, nulls in places and you're not handling that, uh, that's one of the things that sort of static analysis will do for you. So static analysis is bad unless it knows about your code. And that's where we come into sort of, you know, adding in what pr previously was like type ins in PHP, the type declarations, you know, telling, a, telling your functions that this is an integer or a string or a boolean or a class or something else. So this is a very helpful thing to do. So provide types where you can. I mean, this is 
If you can do it, I would recommend doing it. I think it depends on your team size, on, on what you've got to do within your code. You know, if you're on like legacy PHP 5, 6 or something, uh, it's unfortunate, but you know, you, you kind of limited what you can do there. Um, but you know, if you can start sneaking in to get clear intent in your code base, especially in legacy, it probably will make it easy to clean up as you go because you can start, start seeing, seeing these things. So this goes into another PHP storm, good one. Generated doc blocks. If you know when you're typing a function declaration and it will try and do some doc blocks for you at the, at the top of the class, um, they're always wrong. They're always generally going to say like something mixed, something else mixed, and that's because PHP storm can't go back and infer enough about the code that you're putting in there to, to, tell, you, um, to tell you more about it. What about facades? So this is a, a big one that sort of breaks down um, static analysis in, in Laravel, potentially. Facades, obviously, they, they work like a static. Lots of these tools don't know about them. Um, fortunately for us, there are some things that will, will help us do this. Um, there are a lot of tools on the market now that um, can go in and do static analysis on your code, some tailored to Laravel, some more specific PHP. So we've got SAM. So SAM is a tool that um, does exactly this. So it will go through your code base, look at your types, tell you about mismatches, tell you about um, if you're calling um, a method on a class that you've given it the wrong class, SAM will, will error. Um, SAM will tell you about if you're not handling a null condition, and a lot more. So we've got PHP Stan. So PHP Stan does a lot of the similar things to SAM. Um, it also has a lot of community additions that um, you can pull in to um, handle other cases like unhandled, unhandled false or unhandled bits of if statements. And we've got Laristan. So Laristan kind of builds on top of, of PHP Stan um, and will sort of understand how Laravel works under the hood to give you uh, better typing information and better analysis of your Laravel code, it won't complain about facades, it won't complain, you know, saying unhandled static access because it, it knows that oh, I actually go back here and look in the container and look at this underlying object and that, that is a good thing for Laravel. And we've got Rector. So Rector is a, a CLI tool which does uh, a lot of similar things to what Frank went through this morning inside of PHP Storm, but on a, a CLI basis, there's about a couple of hundred of these refactorings built in to Rector. Um, it's really good for working with legacy and cleaning up your legacy apps. Um, it can do things like singleton to service conversion. Um, it can go in and add type ins for bits of the code automatically that it can infer types about. Um, it can go like one of the big things, uh, PHP, uh, PHP unit 8 upgrade, all of a sudden everything had to have a void return type. If you've got a huge test suite you're trying to upgrade, you're going to have to sit there and go manually do it, or you can do something like Rector. You can go through and just add all of those return types for you. All right, so SAM. You can find that at SAM.dev. Uh, this is a project written by Vimeo. So Vimeo had a very large PHP 5 era kind of code base, um, lots of mess. Um, it ca this came out of their need to try and refactor and clean up their code base, and they were like, we can't really do this with what's out here in PHP, so one of their guys has built SAM. So I can look at additional type information that may not be supported in PHP, and you know, at the time this was you know, PHP 5, I think it was 5.4 or 5.5 era, you know, we didn't have um, scalar type ints, we didn't have return types, so it sort of it came out of that necessity, um, and even now in PHP there's some things that aren't supported, um, which we'll go into a bit later, um, that SAM will help us do that aren't in the language yet, and hopefully, you know, they're going to start getting there later on. Handles generics. So generics are really good to say that I've got a, a collection of something, is like the sort of, the basic example here. I've got a collection of users or a collection of invoices. In PHP, there's no sort of way to do this in a generic way, otherwise you're making your own collection classes to say that here's my invoices. Um, and then you know handling all of all of the, the type checking inside of your own custom class um, with something like SAM, um, you can you know say that this is my collection of invoices, and the static analysis will understand that if you're trying to add a non-invoice into that, it'll complain 
before you start running your application and hopefully you know, catch some of those errors if you don't have test coverage around that, or even if you do, it's just a good, good sanity check. So type variables. So um, right now, as we stand, PHP 7.3, um, on a class, we can't say I have a, a private name that is a string. PHP 7.4, we can. Um, that's a good thing, but right now we can't, um, so that helps here as well. There's a lot of different strictness levels in SAM of how you want it to look at your code base and give you these error reports. Um, what you can do is something that's really valuable. You know, if, if you've got this big legacy mess of an application that you're looking at and you go, oh, I really want to start adding these types and everything else or add these checks for new code so I can make sure all my new code is, has got all this stuff and is thoroughly checked and everything else, um, you can set these strictness levels. Um, you can build a baseline so you can say anything new I want to look at, anything old I don't really care about so much. Um, and that sort of allows you to pull it, pull it in and start building up and then, you know, as you're going back visiting code, you can remove these whitelists, remove things from the baseline and say, okay, I want to go look at this other piece of legacy code now. So there's 78 different rules in SAM. You know, like unhandled null um, is probably a big one. Mismatch type is a big one. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so, so many. Okay, so we've got PHP stand. So it's very similar to SAM. Um, it's been around for a little bit longer than SAM. Um, it's based off the, the PHP compiler that um, Nikita Popov wrote for PHP. Um, it's got a lot of community plugins, more so than SAM, um, but it does, does a lot of the same stuff. There's an online playground for it at uh, phpstand.org, so you can go in there and paste in some code and you can sort of see what um, these static tools will say about the code. So then we've got Laristan. So this is probably, depending on, I suppose everyone in the room is using Laravel. <laughs> this, is, this is the big one. So it's basically PHP Stan um, with a whole bunch of Laravel specific <coughs> knowledge. It's Laravel flavored. That's better, right? So it's good. Knows about facades, Laravel internals. That's probably the, the biggest problem you're gonna have with all the other, other sort of tools um, when they start using Laravel specific things, these you know, global helper functions, facades, all of that stuff. The other tools go, oh, what is, what is this? I don't know about it. I can't, I can't infer. Um, Laristan handles that for us. And Rector, this does instant code upgrades like I mentioned before with um, adding in return type hints, adding in uh, refactorings for legacy things like singleton to service. It'll go generate good dot blocks for you as well. So, you know, if it can do, do type inference on your code, it can go in and put in those dot blocks, put in the return type information, then also go build the dot blocks for the things that aren't really supported in the language, um, like those generics. So in PHP 4, um, 7.4 rather, we get type properties. So um, if you've got the legacy um, <coughs> syntax for a type variable um, in a dot block, one of their refactorings is to go and move that to a native PHP um, implementation. You can also refactor Laravel facades to dependency injection. So this is like a, a bit of a, a controversial one, but you can sort of understand, you know, in some controllers you may be using five, six, seven different facades. It doesn't really look obvious that you're doing a lot of mess, you're mixing a lot of concerns there. But, you know, maybe doing something like this, it becomes obvious, oh, I'm actually depending on like nine services in this this one thing, maybe I should split these out into, into their own kind of thing. It's great for legacy. I mean, I don't, show of hands, who works on a legacy application? It's a very large amount. Yeah, so this is a great tool for, for legacy and kind of improving that way you can um, in a kind of automated way. Um, suggest you have a good look at this one as well. This is five things that someone I know quite well hates a lot. <laughs> he hates coding comments. So he doesn't, doesn't like dot blocks. He, doesn't, he likes dot blocks, but he doesn't like dot blocks affecting behavior and, and things like that. Useless dot blocks. You know, if you've got things in the language, like if you've got a function that takes an integer and a string and you can describe that in a language, there's no point also describing that in a dot block. It just adds, adds more noise. 
He doesn't like type declarations because he's a dynamic man. Um, <laughs> but like I've talked about before, type show intent. He doesn't like cider with ice. So if you, if you get him a cider, make sure you, you get no ice. It, it just waters it down. He probably hates me after this talk, um, but that's okay. <laughs> Static analysis really likes these dog blocks. Um, unfortunately, because you know we are in PHP, we don't have these features at a language level. So you know this, this is what we can do um, using dog blocks. So so right now, you know, we can't do this. The the big one here really is is the money. You know, I wish I could deposit an array of money, and I wish I could say that this was an owner. Luckily, in, in PHP 7.4, we'll get this, but right now, uh, we can't do something like this. So what we can do with these extra tools like PHP, Stan, or SAM is that we can you know, do this at bar and say that this is an owner and say that this variable, this money, is an array of money, and that's OK. And then these tools will go look at your code and be able to pick up on that and you know, tell you if, for whatever reason, you've tried to deposit something that isn't money, that's going to be picked up before You've hopefully you know, deployed your code, you know, run these tools as part of your CI pipeline or something. So 7.4. So you notice that we, we get to clean up that, that owner variable. We get to use the native function in the language um, and get rid of the noise. So yeah, don't use unnecessary dot blocks. If you can avoid it, I mean, I think it, it depends on your coding style, but I think the least amount of code in a file is probably a good thing. If you've got language features, uh, let's use them. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, though, with this stuff. SAM can be annoying, um, especially on a legacy code base. You know, you might, you might do a run through. We did this on a legacy app that we had, and we had over 10,000 SAM errors. And it was very quick just to say, oh, what do I do here? I'm just going to walk away. Uh, but no, luckily, like I said before, you can make baselines so you can go in and think all of your new stuff can be type checked and work, work your way back. And all the different levels as well, um, you can ignore some errors, like if you don't care about handling unhandled nulls, which is probably a bad one, but you know you can not, not do that. So this is one of the, the, the sad things in SAM. So we'll find a user. Uh, we, if we do our check to see if we, we don't have a user, if we call, call a method on user, SAM will still give us this error saying calling function on a possible null. So we have to go back and define that you know, we're, we're safe to say that this is definitely a user because it just can't, can't do that inference for us. Like It doesn't understand that, that this check here is actually pr protecting us about this. So this is some code without types. I mean, it looks, it looks nice and clean. We're finding all of our transactions. We've got some arbitrary function here to find if a number is over 9,000. And then we're just passing this into an array map to get a true or false for those. This is what it looks like with, with, uh, with types in, in line using some of these static analysis tools. So you can see here that um, we can say that we've got a collection of transactions, which is, is very valuable, that can kind of help us um, handle those edge cases before we're, we're shipping code. Uh, we're typing our number, we've got our return on our Boolean. <coughs> Some will complain about all of these if you don't have them, depending on your strictness levels. And then down here in your, in your map, you've got all your types, type information as well. I mean, this is a subjective thing. It's either good, it's good or bad. Um, I think it's really, it's a personal choice, but you know, based on my experience, having using these tools and adding in information about types you know, does help catch issues that may exist. <coughs> um, but there's no solutions, right? There's only trade-offs. So some people might, like, might not like writing all of these things about types and messing up their code and, and everything else. Some people might. It, it's, a, it's a personal thing. I think you know, it's something you should, should try for yourself. If you, you're in a big ball of legacy and there's... Um, you're trying to get out of it, I think this is one of those, those things that can help. Uh, if you have any questions, you'll be able to find me, uh, Santa Greenwood, on Twitter. Um, also pretty active on the PHP Australia Slack. Uh, there's 
a whole bunch of us here uh, today that met for the first time at the conference, which was really great. Uh, and my blog there, uh, sarahgreenwood.me. Um, I'll be around for bowling and laser skirmish tonight, so um, if you want to know more about this stuff, come find me, grab a beer, a soft drink or a wine, and we can talk about it because it's yeah, something I'm pretty passionate about. Right, thank you. <laughs>